Welcome to um, our penultimate academic forum of the spring semester. Um, so we have several things coming up, including fun sound effects. Um, of course, uh, on April 27th, we'll have our last academic forum of the semester. We'll be hearing from Steve Walter on um, issues encountered in the development of instruments for assessing children's L2 oral proficiency. So how do you measure how well students are learning a second language, especially orally? Come hear Steve talk about some issues they encountered and hopefully some best practices. Obviously today we're hearing from Michael Booten, um, I'm sure with some examples from from Bongi, a language near and dear to his heart about naming conventions, so that's exciting. Um, but we have a couple of thesis dissertation things happening in the next couple of weeks too. Um, on Wednesday, April 19th, uh, in Mailer 8, uh, Jason Penny will be defending his MA thesis on uh, looking at pluractionality and the Hebrew PL. Uh, it's a pretty good thesis. Um, I'm on the committee, so I can't say too much, but you should come. And then on, uh, yes, one, one thirty after lunch. One or one thirty? I don't remember. Well, it's not going to be before one. It's at one. Okay. One next door in Mailer Eight. Uh, there will probably be a Zoom. A Zoom. Yeah. Yeah. There. So. More info to come, somehow, and then on uh, Monday the twenty fourth, uh, in the Siwa Avery Room, that's past the dining hall. Uh, from 5.30 to 6.30, the very first of our PhD students will be defending her thesis, Anya Yuzhevskaya. So this is a milestone. Our first PhD student come out and support. Um, so lots of stuff going because, of course, it's the last two or three weeks of class. And so everything gets shoehorned in at the end of the semester. But before we hear from Michael, let me open us with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Lord, thank you uh, so much for the the wealth of uh, knowledge and fun we can have. Um, thank you for uh, lunchtime and for Zoom, uh, as well as for being in person. Um, give Michael a clear thought and communication that we might learn something and be able to help him as well refine uh, his presentation. Uh, in all things, Lord, may we remember that we're dependent on you and on your son, through whom we pray. Amen. Okay, thanks, Josh. Uh, yeah, I want to start by thanking three people who are responsible to helping me to get this, this together. Uh, one of them is Gary Simons uh, and the people at the Pike Center. I've been reading stuff in the Pike Center uh, this semester about interdisciplinary stuff, and it got me thinking. Another one is Erin San Gregory. She and I get together and talk every, she's an adjunct faculty member. We get together and talk every couple of weeks about interdisciplinary stuff. And I thought, okay, hey, this is motivating me to do something. I actually ought to do something interdisciplinary. And the third one is uh, Katrina Desai, who is one of my two administrative assistants along with Caitlin. Uh, th this semester, I, I've got these old anthro notes that I had in a shoebox file. So I went one day and I went down to the to the uh, near Mar not Marlin's office, Jonathan's office down there, and I was going to talk. I found Brett down there. I was going to talk to him about converting this old shoebox into my Flex database because I knew Jonathan didn't want to hear the term. Actually, he heard me talking to Brett. And he didn't want me talking to Brett about the shoebox. So I, I, I went back. I said, come on, Brett, well, you could do this. I went back and I talked to Katrina about this. And I had had this shoebox data file that we collected of our anthro notes back in the day. I used the outline of, of cultural materials by Murdoch, his old stuff from the 1960s. And that's how we organized our 
our shoe box, which was anthro file, which was different from our shoe box lexicon. And I th I've always thought, boy, it would be nice if I could get this stuff into my flex, this notes stuff in the flex database. And Katrina figured out how to do that. So she got this nice notes in here, which I was able to use for this topic. Now, the, the target, part of the reason why I set the name for this is because I was trying to get people, you know, I thought, well, if I'm going to give this talk, if I just do this linguistic thing, only people interested in linguistics will come. But maybe if I'll talk about, you know, some anthropology, linguistics, and say that it has relevance for translation, then I can get people from all three different things. Now, of course, the problem with this is when you do an interdisciplinary talk like that, everything probably gets watered down a little bit, so then nobody's actually going to leave real happy. But hopefully there's something for everybody here. Okay, so now the intro to the paper. Instead of doing a PowerPoint, which Caitlin offered to do for me and Katrina, I decided I'm just going to go through this handout here uh, today, all right? So I'm going to tell you about when I first went out to Bongi Island to start learning a language, okay, uh, with my wife and I. And uh, the first thing that, yes, Paul. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. So uh, we didn't have a Slacker course back in the day. Uh, we had what was called LAMP, all right? Uh, thank you, Josh. So uh, we have this LAMP method, and the basic idea behind the LAMP method was to memorize a text and go out and ask as many people as you can about this text, you know? So I memorized this text, and the first, there were two uh, questions in the text. They were number one and number two here. The first question was, and what new? What are you doing? Which you could greet someone on the path. You could greet someone at their house. Anywhere that you saw them, they came up to the house. You could say, what new? And it's kind of like, uh, hey, how are you? Okay. And the response that you get from people is nada, which means nothing. Uh, you say, what are you doing? They say nothing. It's kind of like when you ask someone when you're walking by. And I'm sure a number of you have asked me how I'm doing, and I'm on my way to class. I'm just going to say, fine. I'm not going to stop and chat with you. How are you doing today? How's the weather and all that? I'm on my way to class. I don't have time for that. You probably know. So it's kind of like that. When you answer in data, it's not like you're picking up on this conversational over. That's all that this is, is do you want to have a conversation with me? Okay. So when literally the first answer to my uh, anthropology question of what are you doing in order to start a conversation with someone, the literal answer was nothing. Then I moved on quickly to my second question. My second question was, it's an odd no. What's your name? I was dumbfounded by the response that I got. People looked at me like I was crazy. Nobody would tell me what their name was. It, you know, so for the first few months, I was pretty discouraged. I thought, man, how am I ever going to learn this language? Nobody can answer my simplest question. What's your name? Well, at the time, I didn't know it was impolite to ask people directly their name. If you're going to ask someone your name, you don't ask them. You ask the person who's with them. What's his name or what's her name? Or better yet, not ask someone who's with them to ask someone else. So that was my introduction to uh, personal names. Last time I went to Malaysia was in 2017. I had a good laugh with this Christian woman because back in, in when I was initially uh, out there, I, my first director, Ken Smith, uh, said, hey, you should work on kinship. I started working on kinship. I did this kinship paper that he helped me actually get published in Anthropological Linguistics. So I'm working on kinship, then I'm doing these genealogies, and I was, during the course of this genealogy, some people got mad at me because I was starting to figure out that there were taboo things too, including the names of dead people, okay? Anyway, when I was getting this genealogies, I asked this woman by the name of Bay Song who came over to my, over my house. Hey, what's that person's name? I don't remember who it was. And she told me, see, Bansok. Okay, now Bansok, so I dutifully wrote that down in my anthro notes, you know, Bansok. And then a couple of day, days later, I was asking someone, hey, who's see Bansok? And they started laughing, okay, because Bansok is the name of a house post. Well, if I can go ahead. 
Okay, I'm not sure what you're doing here to me, but okay. So a uh, uh, bonsoak was the name of a house post. So sh she and I were laughing about how she had misled the. Maybe this person that I asked was actually she couldn't say the name because certain names of relatives are taboo. All right. So this talk, I'm going to talk about some linguistic aspects of personal names, and I'm going to talk about some uh, cultural aspects of personal names. First, in terms of linguistic aspects, there are uh, there is no, there's no case marking in Bongi on common nouns. So you see this common noun here for fish, sada, there's no case marking. Like the language Paul worked on had case markers on uh, common nouns, but this one does it. So one of these things that these uh, personal name clinics, there are two personal name clinics. You see it here, number four. There's this C that occurs on personal names, which are the subject. So it gets the dominant case gloss there. And then there's this other personal name clinic in the underlying form for this one, I'm calling uh, a palatal nasal. It shows up here as, as this nasal before alveolars, okay? So you get these two in the, uh, the C personal name marker also has a case marking function, whereas this other one, only has uh, a noun class marking function. That is, I'm distinguishing between a personal name and common nouns. This is uh, found frequently in quite a few Philippine type languages. Okay, so down here you see non-subject personal names are marked by this palatal nasal, which is realized in number four as an N, okay? So uh, Tagi uh, is a woman's name, she shows up marked by C when she's the subject. When Tagi is the object of the clause, like here, she gets the end marker. Here, Tagi is uh, an oblique argument. Uh, Mwal gives the fish to Tagi. This is a preposition, so this is an oblique argument. Uh, here, Tagi is uh, the possessor of the fish. So these are uh, uh, the two different forms, various functions that, that it has. So the C marks the subjects, Everything else, no matter what the grammatical relations, gets marked with the other clinic. Okay, now there's some phonology involved in these personal name markers. One of the things that you have to know is that personal names that begin with an S, like Steve, do not get a, a, a personal name marker. You don't have any C Steve. You could get a C Pete, C Marlon, C, no, 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 no C Scott. Okay, all right. So, in here, for you folks that are interested in translation, uh, I have some examples from the Bongi Gospel of Mark here. So when it was morning, Simon and his friends went looking for Jesus. So here, Simon here doesn't show up with a C in front of it uh, because it's uh, uh, it begins with S, all right? Whereas down here uh, in number 10, uh, uh, his name was Lee he was Alpheus's son. Here, okay, see, Liwi is the subject of the sentence, so it gets the C. Now, before vowel, before vowel initial names, you get this uh, palatal nasal, which we've written orthographically as a NY, okay? Before names that begin with an uh, uh, a D, uh, you get, or a T, you get a N, like endowed, okay? So this is, uh, Raja Ganengi Itala Kuturunan uh, Daud. The Raja, the king, uh, promised by God, uh, was David's descendant. All right, from Mark 12 35. Uh, before names that begin with uh, a lateral, like Lewi for Levi, uh, the personal name marker that's the non subject one shows up as S. So you get two alamors of C. It's either C for the for the subject or a zero. And for this non-subject ones, you get you don't get uh, a marker before S and then you get these very various phonological condition markers. Now I wanted to say something about preplosion here. I've talked to Steve Parker about preplosion here before. The reason I wanna say something about preplosion, which only occurs in Bongi, uh, is because personal names are not preploded, but, uh, uh, place names are preploded. So it's not like you can't preplode a, a, a place name. Okay, so the way that preplosion works, nasalization in Bongi uh, is, uh, it, it, it follows a nasal, okay? 
So this is the orthographic form here in italics. This is the underlying form. This nasal here turns on nasalization for the number six. And once nasalization is turned on, that vowel right before the final nasal is nasalized so there's no preplosion, all right? Whereas down here, the word for corn, this is the Malay word for wheat, which bongi board and has become corn. Gandobum is preploded because although this nasal, nasal here would turn on nasalization, the D blocks nasalization from going on. There's something called nasal harmony. It's like vowel harmony. Na a nasal consonant turns on nasalization. It keeps marching until it hits a consonant that blocks it. Semi-vowels and vowels don't block nasalization. So this is uh, non, a non-nasalized vowel, so it gets preploaded at the end. This is pronounced gondom. Now, the reason I brought that up is because I wanted to show you some place names. This place name here, Sandakan, is a major city uh, in the state of Sabah over on the east coast, Sandakan. And you'll notice in Bongi, uh, this last A is not, not nasalized, so it gets preploaded. It's pronounced Sandahadn, okay? Modabm is the, is the Bongi word for black, is pronounced Modabm, all right? So you get this preplosion. Oh, you say, hey, how come this one isn't preploaded? That's because this velar nasal here turns on nasalization in Kapitangan. That A is nasalized, so it's not preploaded. So it's actually following the phonological rule. Okay. All right. So you see down here, Kasim, it's not Kasim, it's not Mundabm. I think part of this is because these people from the other ethnic groups, this is the only language that has that has a uh, preplosion in, you get this, you get something like kankong. For those of you who like a water spinach, okay, this is a grows wild. That's the Malay or the Indonesian term for this. In Bongi, they call it kankokun. Well, speakers of these other languages can't pronounce kankokun. And I think in order to, to not be negative, the Bongi don't want to give any of their kids names like that are preploaded. There are no preploaded names. Okay. Oh, the only time that I heard a preploaded name was from one of my sons. My youngest son one time shocked me with our last name. Our last name is Putin, right? Okay. That I is not is not nasalized. My youngest son, Micah, someone asked him his name one time and he said, Micah Putin. And that's the only time that I ever heard preplosion, okay, non-native speaker saying that, applying the rule for the phonological rule. Okay, uh, these, these personal name markers look a lot like titles. In one way, I'd almost, it, I've called them personal name determiners and some stuff. And then when I was working on this paper, I thought maybe I should call these titles because they, they have the same position as titles, but they don't quite... Uh, appear like titles, okay? So you get a title like doctor, doctor, for here's Dr. Moy, Paul. Ihi ikpangan Dr. Moy. We were friends with Dr. Moy. So that doctor takes the place of uh, the personal name marker, okay? And Sigu, uh, born from Malay, Chigu for teacher. Sigu Lian was uh, Camus's wife, okay? Sa i Camus, his possessor with Camus, okay? Now, so you get these things in the in the Bible as well. Like quite a few religious terms are borrowed from Arabic. So you get Nabi Aliyah for a term, and you get Roger Herodes, uh, uh, King Herod heard about Jesus. So uh, I've used scripture examples in here where I can to demonstrate how these things have been used in the scripture. Okay, so you get Roger Herodes here, uh, also heard about Jesus. Ah. Uh, one of the interesting things about Bakatis is, uh, you know, Bakatis, when you call someone's name, uh, you take the second syllable of their name. So, Lynn, oh, that's you, Marlon. Oh, I, 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 I'm, I'm using the vocative to get Marlon's attention. I call him Lynn. I take the second syllable of his name. All Bungi names are disyllabic. Most Austronesian roots, verbs, and nouns are disyllabic. You get functor words that aren't. Some some names are trisyllabic, have three syllables. Okay, so Tipa, who lived with us for a few years, I, I could say to her, Pa uta kenditi, all right? So I, I do this vocative, all right? Now, one of the things that distinguishes these, uh, uh, the vocatives 
from the, from, I mean, one of the things that distinguishes personal names is uh, when you do the vocative of a personal name, you don't put the marker in there. Okay, so this is Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane talking to Judas when he comes up to him. Hey, you gonna kiss me? Okay, so he calls him Judas and he doesn't say see Judas. So uh, when, you, when you use a vocative, these personal name markers don't occur, all right? And these, but these titles can be used as evocative. So uh, Paul in Acts 16, he, he addresses Agrippa a couple of times. One time he says, uh, Raja, uh, while I was in the middle of the road on my way to so-and-so, the Holy Spirit came upon me. You know the story. Okay, another time at the end he says, hey, Raja Agrippa, uh, I know that you believe. He's trying to get R Raja Agrippa to believe at that time. So these, these titles can be used as evocative, but you can't use C as evocative. All right, so now I want to talk about uh, some, that was the linguistic stuff behind this okay these personal name markers have a case marking function and a noun marking function they've got some interesting phonological stuff that's going on with this phonological condition alamos okay in terms of cultural things uh anthropono anthroponymy okay that's the study of proper human names it, it results in multiple uh in multiple identities okay children are usually not given a personal name until the time of confinement is over. Okay, ladies, if you give birth over there, you got to stay in the house for 44 days and 44 nights before you can go on out, all right? You've got a time of, you've got a, a, a time of confinement for 44 days and 44 nights. There's a lot of other things associated with 44 that's really interested in this culture because you know it's the number of completion, see? That's what I've sort of figured out. Okay, yeah, the number of completion when you look at that, here's four and here's four, four. Yeah. Did you know that there are 44 parts of a pig when you butcher it? Did you know that there was a flood on the earth for 44 days and 44 nights that it covered the earth? And there's a whole bunch of, there's some other stuff associated with 44, but that's a side issue. Okay. Uh, children are not normally given a personal name until these 44 days of confinement are up. If your child dies during these 44 days, you don't bury him. You go hang the body up in a tree out in the woods. Okay. Now, uh, one of the things that in Malaysia is required is required an identity card, all right? Children get their identity card when they're about 12 or 13 years old, all right? But usually, oh, okay, in order to get an identity card, you have to have a, a birth certificate, okay? So you, parents have to go down and register the birth, okay? So like, let's say Scott here, he's the village chief. so. He's going to go down because he's trying to set a good example for the rest of us. He's going to go down and register his birth. But I'm just a a, a, a peon in the village, you know. I, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to wait till the 44 days are up before I'm going to go down. So the name that shows up on your birth certificate is also the name that shows up on your IC later. That's your identity card. It's also the name that you register in school. It's also the name that you get on your marriage certificate, and it's also the name that you get on your death certificate. That's the official name. But I'm not gonna call my kids by the official name, I'm gonna call them by their village name, which, you know, the, the village name gets used until they get in school. The village name or the family name, and that's what people know the people, know the kids by their village name. Now, if you're, one of the reasons why you don't name a child until the 44 days are over is because Children are weak, and they oftentimes are sickly. And you don't want the spirits to come in and put a sickness on them, okay? So you don't you don't call them by their name. You call them son, you call them daughter. If I go over to your house, I'm not gonna call your kid by your name. So that's why you don't even come up until they're at least 44 days strong, okay? Now, uh, okay. Yeah, so all children are required to get these this uh, birth certificate eventually. Eventually, you need the birth certificate if you want to go to school and, or if you want to get an ID card. And you can't hardly do anything in Malaysia without an uh, identification card. Okay. 
Uh, so if your child is sick quite a bit during the course of their childhood, they'll change their names quite a bit too. Now, one of the things that the Bongi do, they also have this uh, uh, a namesake, a partial namesake. Because one of the things you don't do is you don't name your child after yourself. You name your child something that can sound like your name. So I've got some examples here. There was a, a friend of mine by the name of Mual who had a son named Tuol. There was a woman by the name of Sagut who had a daughter named Lagut. There was a, a friend of mine named Kusung and she had a daughter named Moonsung and a niece named Vesung. Okay, so in each of these is taking the last syllable, kind of like the vocative, and making that to an, a name, all right? Now, one of the things you don't do is you never name your kid after another bongi. Why? Because the names of dead people are taboo. So why would you name your kid after someone who's going to be dead? All right, so nobody has the name of their father or their mother. Okay, so... Uh, one of the ways, by the way, of avoiding names is that they got this word like uh, whatchamacallit, okay? Yeah, whatchamacallit is uh, right in here. Whatchamacallit, oh, this is not whatchamacallit because it has the personal name marker on it. We changed whatchamacallit into what's her name or what's his name by putting this in. It's an indefinite pronoun. Uh, that's in this language. So it's got the C marker on that. So when, when someone dies, the, the name of that person is, is taboo. Now, some of these names, although you can't name somebody after uh, a bone, after, you know, their parent, you can name something after a Malay noun, all right? So I know a woman by the name of Karatas, that's the Malay word for paper, I know a guy by the name of Tali, that's the Malay word for rope. Actually, it stands more than rope. You could take a vine and you could use it to tie something up. So it basically means rope or anything that you could tie with, okay? I know we had a woman who lived with us. I think, Paul, you knew Darat. She lived with us for a long time. Her name means land. I know this other woman named Five, okay? The strongest taboo is not on the names of dead people, you're not supposed to say the name of your parents, okay? But when the government brought in this identification card stuff, you always have to say the name of your parents when you go to school. Nobody says the name of parents in the household, you know, or talking to them. But in the school, I mean, the school teachers, they don't speak Bongi. They speak Malay. And uh, Malaysian names are always in the form of your name and then bin if you're a son, binti, if you're a daughter, like the Arabic one, then with your father's name. So your father's name sticks with you throughout life. You don't change your name when you get married, like here in the U.S. Okay, so the strongest taboo is against in-laws. And one of the interesting things about the in-laws are, okay, well, let me say, say this first about children will tease uh, other kids by calling them fatty or something like that in here. These are made up. Those kind of nicknames don't stay with them. But these taboos can be can be quite strong. This woman named Lima, you can't say the name of your in-laws. What if you're the son-in-law? Yeah, one way to tease the son-in-law to try to get him to say five, which, come on, five's got to come up sometime, right? As you ask the son-in-law, hey, what's four plus one? You know, so they joke around with them and this sort of stuff to get them to try to say the, the taboo name. Okay, now there's there's this, this one guy, this shocked me so much. There's this one guy named Mr. Limp. Okay, here's the C marker for limp. Kalampang means limp, okay? Uh, Nanya, his actual name is Siakwe, all right? His name is Akwe. He was a native chief out there. And, but they nicknamed him Si Kalampang because he had a little sort of limp to him when he walked, right? Interestingly, I heard his kids talk to him, uh, talk about him as Si Kalampang, you know? I didn't think that children could use nicknames for their parents, but they actually use nickname. There was another language uh, Alana's, my wife, her first language helper was Tagi, okay? Here's the the form of names over there for female. And her father's name was Limbatan, Tagi Binti Limbatan, okay? Uh, Tagi, 
had a mother-in-law who was blind. And Tagi would call her Sibulag, all right? So here's one way of getting around the, the taboo on saying, say, saying the name of your in-laws was to, was to give them a nickname. Now, you see a nickname here in the New Testament. Also in Acts chapter 13, there was this Simon, one of the, one of the uh, disciples there, who was nicknamed Imodab, okay, um, the black, all right? People uh, expect that he was darker for some place. I forgot what, what place it was. Okay, kinship terms. Kins kinship terms for a speaker and addressee's parents, grandparents, and children are treated as personal names. That is, some Kinship terms are going to get this C marker on it that is treated as personal name when it's a subject, and some aren't. And the ones that are going to get it are your parents, your grandparents, and your kids. All right. So here you see this in Mark uh, 13, where Jesus says, Siama say, only my father knows. Okay. Uh, in reference to God the Father. And down here, oh, this is where they told Jesus, hey, your mother and your brothers are out there. They said, uh, go to your mother, Siendo Nu, your mother, okay? That's because the speaker and the addressee, if I'm talking about your mother or father, I've got to use the personal name marker. If I'm talking about someone else's mother or father, I don't use it. The same kinship terms are treated as common nouns when a speaker is referring to someone other than the speaker's uh, or addressee's parents, okay? So here... Oh, the niece, talking about uh, Herod's niece here, went to ask the mother. Okay, so this is the mother's, there's no marking of on there, okay? Now, in here, where the guy in Mark 7, he comes to Jesus for healing for his daughter. He says to him, help, uh, Sidakin. See, he refers, this is how you refer to your son, and your daughter during those 44 days of confinement and when they're young. If you can avoid personal names, avoid them, okay? So you show up at someone's house, I don't say your daughter's name. I say, how's Sidak, you know? Okay, uh, here's another instance of daughter being used, but this was in the subject position. This is in the non-subject position. This is the object of a preposition here, so it doesn't get the C marker on it. Okay, and here's one from Mark 9, uh, talking about, hey, I brought my son to you, and they couldn't heal him. He's talking about Nyeli. Here's the non-subject marker, uh, the uh, uh, non-subject marker on the son here. That's the word for son. Now, there's an interesting uh, phenomena that happens in a number of languages over in this part of the world. It's called technonyms. Technonyms... It, are you named, when you become a parent, you become somebody, okay, is what a technonym are. Basically, hey, even for you non marrieds if you're non-married and you don't have any kids, you're basically not too responsible yet, you know? Uh, when you first get married, you can live with your parents, you can live, you, you live with your parents or with your in-laws until you have a kid. And once you become a kid, you gotta take responsibility for that. I'm gonna quit feeding it, you know? Uh, so, I mean, I'm not going to take responsibility for you. You're a grown up now that you've got a kid. Whereas you can be kind of, you can be pretty slack and if you don't have kids. All right. Well, that's enough on that. Anyway, a technonym is the custom of naming parents after their oldest child. So here uh, in March chapter 16, oh yeah, they're going to the tomb here. Uh, when... Uh, the day of worship was finished after the Sabbath was over. See Maria, see Mary from Magdalena, Mat Sulami, okay, Solomon. She doesn't have a C before or an E or any marker before because her name begins with an S. And Indo Usus, the mother of James, they went and they bought some perfume to go and anoint Jesus. Jesus. Technonyms are treated like common nouns, not personal names. Oh, Here's a really here's a really cool one. One time I was listening to these people talk, and one of them said, I'm a lion. Uh -huh. I'm a lion. Who's that? Okay. 
Lion was this non-bongi. He was a Bajau guy that lived out there. Okay. Someone called him Amat Lion, and I know he wasn't Lion's father. All right. What's going on in here? Amat Lion's name was Nawa. Nawa rhymes with Nadawa. Okay. Uh what what was going on here was conversationally two people were in an argument. And we're, we're sort of arguing with one another and one was getting accused of one uh, of something. And he says, you know, he basically denied it. So the other one says to him, Aba Yawa, Amat Lion, aha. Amat Lion, Lion's father is named uh, Nawa. And so what that meant, you're denying it just like Lion's father, who's Nawa. Okay, this is uh, quite complex pragmatics here, Paul. <laughs> it's an interesting pragmatics. You're Lion's father. So basically say you're defending yourself against this accusation by acting like that dude over there. Okay, necronyms. These are death names, all right? After people die, well, here in the US, you've got a term like widow and widower, okay? That's about it. But you never say to anybody, hey, widow, how you doing today? It's a term of... It's a term of reference, but it's not a term of address, okay? Well, over there, they have a number of these terms of address. So they got a, they got this one, what do we be? B is the oldest male when after their father or their mother dies. So orphan isn't a good name because they still have one parent left, okay? It's the oldest male, okay? And you can see that they act like like uh, personal names because what do be? which is like Mbwotndarat or Mbwotndatn. So these necronyms, which are death names, are the names, uh, are, are the same or functioning like personal names. Okay, so here's a list of necronyms. You got one for widower, widower parent, whose oldest child died outside the womb, uh, oldest male child whose mother, father died, oldest female, second oldest, second oldest, third oldest, third oldest, the last, the last one, okay. Uh, is, is this or the surviving one child with no siblings whose mother or father's died, Sangi, and it doesn't get the S on it because it begins with the S, right? It doesn't get the C on it. Okay, here's an interesting one from scripture, the story about the brothers, right? The seven brothers, okay. Now this, Langu is your sister or your brother-in-law, okay? Now, so if, I'm not gonna, if, if Marlon is my brother-in-law here, I'm picking on you, Marlon, it's good to see you today. Uh, if Marlon is my brother-in-law, I'm not gonna call him Marlon, I'm gonna call him Langu as a term of address. It's a reciprocal term of address to Langu, okay? Uh, but after someone dies, your Langu becomes your your uh, ifug. It's like cognate with ipar, okay? Your Langu becomes your ifug. So in this particular passage, Long ago, there were seven brothers. Now, the oldest one had a spouse, but he died and they didn't have a kid. Not a pa'anak. Okay. The brother in law, not the Langu, the Ifug, because you got to use the necronym. He came and he married his Sumulakn. Sumulakn. Oh, that's an interesting one. You could Sumulakn somebody's spouse. Sumulakn means to pick up some something that's been discarded, okay? So like if I throw this water bottle out and Mike there goes and picks it up, hey, that's a nice water bottle, I like it. So that's what you could do too. You, you know, uh, dump your wife, throw your wife out and someone else can sumo lock your wife. Anyway, the this one, the the brother-in-law died, but the e-bug came and sumo lock. Okay, so you got several of these in there. One of the interesting things about this is that these, uh, personal names do not apply to supernatural beings, okay? You could see that the word for God, sometimes some people say Tala, some people say Itala, clearly bored from the Muslim influence of Allah, okay? C never comes before Tala. You got you got Belgible here. You don't get C Belgible. Although in Mark chapter 5, when the guy who was demon-possessed was asked what his name was, he said, see, Barabm. Okay, because my name is Bara is Mini Bara. Okay, so there you you do get that. In conclusion, names have a classificatory function. Personal names are an inherent part of every language. 
Understanding a group's naming conventions is critical for understanding the social organization. These bongi names are preceded by a proclitic, which have a case marking and an animacy marking function that is distinguishing the difference between personal names and common nouns. They, these, uh, an important part of the life cycle occurs when a, when a person becomes a parent. Once you become a parent, you start calling that person by their oldest child's name, okay? And they take on a new position in the, in, in the society. The study of naming systems helps us eliminate where individuals fit in a social system and the life cycle. Furthermore, accurate translation requires you know how they, how they use the names. Okay, hopefully I, I've ended with about eight minutes of time for questions here. Yeah, Steve. Very interesting, thank you. Uh, you mentioned that the vocative when you call someone directly by their name, they usually use the second syllable. Yeah, the last syllable. Oh, uh, okay, the last syllable. Yeah, and, and most most names are, are two syllables, so the second, last. And then you gave a, a reference after that from when Jesus said to Judas, you come to betray me. Yep. And so I used the full name Judas. Right. So in the Bible, did you ever use that provocative? No. I, I never have used the, the only the last syllable. Okay. Uh, yeah, I thought about that when I was going over there because we, we never did do that. I don't know that the people would know them good enough to have gotten it. You can use the full name, uh, you know, in a bucket. You don't have to, I could say Tipa, Pa, you know, I, I, part of it has to do with intimacy. Okay, so no, never did. That's a good question. So if you were like a government official, you wouldn't usually ever do that with someone? No, you, usually with a government official, you would use the title. Oh. Yeah, but that's a that's an interesting question. Yeah, we never did that. We never just used the final syllable. Uh, yeah, in the New Testament, but it'd be worth it'd be worth you know going back and checking with people would they like to do that? Yeah, Jack Shoemaker on Zoom asks: Are the names of God like He who hears me be treated as vocatives, as personal names? Oh, with the names for God, like the one who sees me, and uh, young Roy. Uh. That are given by various patriarchs in in Genesis, for instance. Yeah, I haven't translated Genesis. I I'm I'm not exactly Maybe sure about that. My names. yeah yeah, I don't think that they'd be treated as personal names. But okay. were nicknames. N nicknames. So this is blind. Yeah, they get the name markers. Every yeah, time. yeah, yeah. The nicknames do get the name markers. But then it's God. So God doesn't yeah. get so, name so, uh, Yeah, I'm not sure how to answer that one because then it is supernatural. You know, now, of course, the elephant in the room, I'm waiting for someone to ask. There weren't any. Well, there weren't any. We have, we have two, two parts. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I know what the elephant in the room is. I'm expert. I mean, I, the first thing that pops into your head is Jesus. That's right. Jesus and his death, and did he die? And is he alive now? <laughs> also, yeah, he didn't have any name marking. Yeah, yeah, Jesus had no name marking on there, and the Bongi insisted on not putting a name marking on that. Okay, so that's pretty interesting. So, is that an exegetical problem? I don't know. I thought some of you translation types would probably pick up on that question. Now, that is kind of the elephant in the room here because Jesus never got marked with a personal name anywhere in the New Testament stuff that we've done. And then after he resurrected, he was called Jesus. Uh, these, these necronyms uh, that you use, they're only there for a, a short season, except for widow or widower, those kind of stuff. Those those stay around for a long time but like you know if your mother or your father dies someone's going to call you you know b for oldest son of a parent who recently died but oh, because all of our parents eventually die you know that only is there for a, a temporary period i don't know how long is the is the taboo on mentioning the name of somebody who's died also somewhat temporary? Because everybody in the Bible, except for 
Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. So, uh, it's primarily on your own family. I mean, okay. You don't go around spouting the names of dead people. Okay. As a matter of fact, when I was working on the genealogies, somebody heard that I was writing down the names of dead people and they wanted to call me for a court case. Yeah, a local court case. And the village chief talked them out of doing it, you know. I was kind of shocked at that. So I, you know, I did it on the sly after I found out that, you know, because I, I was collect I was trying to figure out how all these people were related. So I had these real cool kinship charts, you know. But yeah. Uh do they have like long ago history stories oh yeah yeah and they'll talk about those people like there was a founder who worked some miracles and stuff and he got he gets the c before him his name is damon so these long ago characters do get their name and they'll talk about them but you don't go around talking about like if i knew your grandfather's name and he's dead i don't go around and tell stories about your grandfather in front of you so the, I mean, the, the next thing that comes into my mind in this context is, you know, Jesus, they treated separately. But then in the New Testament, you have various other people who die. Uh, or, and one of them who also comes back to life, Lazarus. Um, and then also maybe there's a lot of discussion about John the Baptist after he's dead, too. Yeah. Um, how did they approach um, uh, those those people? Yeah, the username. Okay. Okay. And, and maybe part of that is because, hey, they're not bongy. They're not offended by it. Like, uh, yeah. it, you know, it's not the cultural offense because they're not related to them. Yeah, Pete. Did you ever hear people who were involved in the translation team sort of wrestle with this? Like, what shall we do with this person's name? Was it that explicit? I don't know. You know, after putting this together recently, I thought I'd like to go back and talk to some of these people about some of this stuff, you know? A little bit more about this stuff and what they're doing now. Actually, they're still working on. We only did part of the New Testament. We didn't finish it. All right. I think when I leave here, I want to get my hands back in that thing. Jack, Jack asks real quick. Um, what's the consequence of breaking the taboo? Is it just bad form, or might the spirit of the deceased come and do something bad? Or I don't know about the spirit coming to do anything bad, uh, but. As I said, I almost got taken to, to court over this. So the consequence is, uh, I'm going to get mad at you. Maybe I'll take a picture of you and I'll jab my knife in it, and that'll put a curse on you. Okay. Yeah. Do, do they get the name of the dead person? Do they get reused? No. No, no. All, names, All names, as far as I know, every name that I ever got was a unique name. Okay. Now, I did find someone one time that they didn't know. Two people were about the same age, and they got the same name in two different villages on the opposite side of the island. But I'm not going to go and make a name of someone that I know from before. Are they possibly have to be a name? Yeah. Yeah. What about last names? Do people there have last names? Oh, your last name is your father's name, right? And you can... So it's not really a last name, Steve, Ben, whatever your dad's name is. And that's going to stay on your birth certificate and all that. So, you know, when Monica married you, she didn't take your name. Okay, I think it's about time, right? So in the Bible, when certain names get reused a lot, different people have the same name. Um, does that, does that uh, make it hard for people to keep track of the fact that it's different people or no problem? They just realize this is a different person. Okay, well, the only text that they've got along genealogies would be like in Luke, the genealogies and the genealogy from. Simon, multiple Marys, multiple James's, multiple, yeah. Is, is that a problem? I know it's. I, I, <laughs> Okay, I'm not saying that they've got all the Mary straightened out. Okay, <laughs> but I, n nobody's really talked about it as a, a problem. If they remember Mary from Magdalena, that Mary versus some other Mary, 
versus Mary, the mother of James. So they don't have any more trouble than we do. Yeah. <laughs> Son of man. Son of man. Jesus identifies. Yeah, I don't remember what we did with that at the moment. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. <laughs> okay, everybody, thanks for coming. Time to go.